Some years ago, I was leading a tour of Christians to the land of Israel. And we were in a hotel outside of Jerusalem, uh, not far from the Knesset, the parliament buildings. And we came in after a day of tour. It was time for our evening meal, about seven o'clock. And many of the people had already eaten. Uh, it was a large hotel with a large restaurant, maybe 300 seats. And uh, we had a table with the sign on it, Nicholson Group, which meant that it was reserved for us. But as we were being served, I noticed a very dignified Jewish woman come and stand at the door and look around the hotel room, the restaurant, and then make a beeline for us. And she said, excuse me, may I share your table with you? And we said, of course. And so she sat down and introduced herself. Her name was Dr. Adaya Barkay. She was responsible for a department of the health services in Israel. I think it was called a mother and child or something like that. She was a pediatrician. And she said to us, uh, may I tell you why I want to share your table with you? And we said, all right. And she said, I've been watching your group for two days and you're all so happy and I want to know the secret. Then she said, well, maybe the word is more contented. And I said, well, I have noticed that contentment is in rather short supply in this city. And I said, you know, the fact is that most of us just met the other day. But the one thing we all have in common is that we love your Messiah. And I said, we've come to know him and through him have come to be worshipers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And she said with a little laugh, well, of course, that's where we would disagree. I said, how's that? And she said, well, I only believe in one God. And I said, well, I'd like to think I'd die before I believed in more than one God. I can say the Shema with all my heart. Jesus said it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. We believe that with all our heart. She said, well, of course, you believe Jesus is God, don't you? I said, yes, but we didn't get that from our Bible. We got that from your Bible. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, we were sinners of the Gentiles. We didn't know anything about the true God. We worship sticks and stones. We dug around in the entrails of chickens trying to figure out the will of God. And we never would have come up with such an idea. We got that from your book. And she said, where do you get it? I said, well, right in the very first verse of your Bible. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And I said, some people might say, well, that's just poetic or there's some symbolism here that it's not really speaking about the plurality of God. But within a very short time, we read that God says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Who was he talking to? Not to the angels. We weren't made in the likeness of angels, but in the image of God. And as we read through the scriptures, why we see Isaiah declaring, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Sounds like a human being to me. But then do you know the rest of that verse? She said, no, and his name shall be called the mighty God. I said, listen to these words from the words of Agur in Proverbs 30. Verse 4 says, who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? I said, you know the answer to those questions? They're not rhetorical. There's a real answer, isn't there? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Well, God, of course. I said, do you know how that verse ends? She said, no. I said, here's how it ends. What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? She said, is that in our Bible? I said, that's in your Bible. She said, for the first time in 40 years, I'm going home to read my Bible. She said, I noticed that you refer to him as Yeshua. She said, we call him Yeshua the Crucified. 
I said, I know you do, and it breaks my heart. She said, why? And I said, well, you know, his name is Yeshua. It was Moses, your great prophet, that came up with that name. He took the name Oshia, salvation, and changed it to G Oshia, Jehovah is salvation. But I said, a clever rabbi came up with this idea. If we called him Yeshu, the Gentiles wouldn't notice. And Yeshu is an acrostic meaning, let his name be blotted out. She said, no. I said, yes. And she thought about it for a moment and she said, it could mean that. I said, it does mean that. And I said, you call him Yeshu the crucified. Because the worst thing that a Jew can think of is to be hanged on a tree. For your scripture says, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. I said, the leaders of your people, normally they would have stoned a man to death for blasphemy. And on a few occasions, they tried to do that with Jesus. But the leaders said, no, we might end up with a martyr on our hands if he's stoned. So we'll get the Romans to kill him. They hang people on trees, not knowing that they were fulfilling the words of your great prophet David, who said, they pierced my hands and my feet. And I said, you know, when the Jewish leaders wanted him under the curse of God, by a happy circumstance, God himself wanted him under the curse of God. For as one of your early rabbis said, Saul of Tarsus, he was placed under the curse of God that he might bear the curse of a broken law for us. And I said, you know, the most wonderful message that was ever heard is the message that God was going to send his own son, this son of whom Agur spoke, the son of whom Isaiah spoke, and send his son to be the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world. You know, we were there till 1130 at night. They cleaned up the tables around us and eventually turned out the lights and left us there. She wouldn't leave. She said, I have never heard this message before. Oh, that God may pull back the veil that is on the hearts of the Jewish people and that millions of them yet may put their trust in Christ. This should be the prayer of God's people and for those who are working among the Jews, that God would give them a door of utterance that they might know how to speak and that the door of faith that has been opened to the Gentiles would also be opened in their hearts. And says the scripture, though the veil is on their hearts, when their heart turns to the Lord, the veil will be removed. I'm so thankful that the Lord has descended from heaven and come into our world that he might seek and save those who are lost. Thank you.